So you're in for a, for a treat. It's my great pleasure to, to introduce Dr. Chris Hammond, who's <laughs> going to um, give us a, a, the, the keynote. Chris is a Bill and Kathy Osborne Professor of Computer Science at Northwestern. He leads their CS plus X initiative, um, their Master's in Science and Artificial Intelligence, and uh, their, um, center, in their Center for Advancing Safety and in Artificial Intelligence. Recently, he was named to the, as a fellow of AAAI, the Association for Advancement of Artificial Intelligence. You can read his full, full bio um, in the, uh, online. My favorite line from it is that he's committed to humanizing computers um, with the aim of stopping the process of mechanizing people. Um, I have some, some my own personal connections to, to Chris that I want to share very briefly. And uh, he may not know, but he has an indirect connection to the University of Texas as well. Um, he's very well known for uh, his um, leading in an area of artificial intelligence no, known as, way back in the day, known as, as case-based reasoning. He, he uh, devo developed a system called Chef, um, which, which uh, was, was um, good at de developing recipes from, um, from past recipes and modifying them with different ingredients. Um, he was my uh, first professor of, of artificial intelligence back when I was a student at the University of Chicago and he was faculty at Chicago. He, uh, I credit him for, for getting me launched um, in, this, in this field. And um, he, we actually also share an academic pedigree. His um, PhD advisor was, was Roger Schenk um, and that's my um, academic great-grandfather. So uh, three generations beyond that, but uh, so there's, I don't know, maybe he's my great uncle uh, or something like that in academic terms. But that connection to UT is that Roger Schenk got his PhD from the University of Texas. And so, um, Beyond that, uh, I think as you'll see, he's a fantastic public speaker when he's not doing computer science. Um, he's an improv comedy um, performer and has, has uh, appeared at Second City and is, is also working on um, a, a show that involves um, improv and, uh, and robots, which he may tell us some about. But I don't want to steal the state to any more time from, from him. If, there's a, if he does uh, follow the time guidelines, we'll have plenty of time for questions afterwards. Take it away, Chris. I will not follow the time guidelines. Just so you know, uh, just so you know, um, I have three numbers written on my hand, uh, 33, 31, and uh, 69, and those are numbers that I will go uh, over to that machine and jump to if uh, need be. Um, thank you, Peter. Uh, that was a very sweet, uh, that was a very sweet intro, and I, um, uh, and thank you for having me here. Um, I, I, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I'm going to talk today about um, a bunch of things, but mostly I'm going to talk about impact. Um, uh, and that is, uh, uh, what does it mean when we think about, um, uh, if, for those of you who develop AI systems, what does it mean for us to think about what those systems are going to do in the world and uh, who and who are they going to impact, who are they going to benefit, and in particular for me, who are they going to hurt? Um, so as Peter said, I'm a, a professor of computer science at Northwestern, um, in, and I've done artificial intelligence uh, oh, all my life. Uh, I, I cannot remember not doing AI. Um, uh, and if you actually work in AI for as long as I've worked in AI, you have to have one abiding belief, and that there is no aspect of human cognition that we will not be able to bring to the machine. Uh, that is creativity, um, intuition, um, certainly good reasoning. Um, uh, these are all things that we are going to bring to the machine. Uh, emotion, uh, we will bring to the machine. Anything that we do, we will bring to the machine. Which is fine. That's what a professor of computer science who does work in AI should have in his head. Uh, on the other hand, um, I have commercial aspects of what I do. Um, and I had a company, Narrative Science. I was a co-founder, chief scientist for it. Uh, we sold it relatively recently to, um, uh, to Salesforce. But I've got to tell you, if you have an engineering team that is working against deadline, having some idiot wander in and say, you know, there's no aspect of human cognition that we can't bring to the machine is not helpful. Uh, uh, and in fact, in having them think about the thing that you thought about in the shower this morning that you think is really clever is not helpful. Because they've got to be thinking about deadlines, they've got to be thinking about their product, they've got to be thinking about uh, their customers, they've got to be thinking about things that are robust and useful in the world. 
So I've got those two things in my head. There is no aspect of human cognition we cannot bring to the machine, and we make it, have to make it useful today. Those two things are always in my head. And then there's this third thing. Um, I did a, a year-long stint with uh, UNIDER, um, um, uh, part of the UN that's looking at uh, disarmament, um, on policy having to do with autonomous lethal devices, colloquially killer robots. And the thing I, I discovered during that period uh, was, aside from the fact that Geneva is a really nice town, um, uh, was that people had no idea what the machine was capable of. I mean, no idea. And I was surrounded by people who were really smart and really well-educated and really passionate, um, who, when I said, well, and then the machine would make a decision, would sit, look at me and go, what are you talking about? Machines don't make decisions. And it would be, yeah, they, they do. They do. And if you think they don't, then you're going to do something and you're going to kill somebody. And you're going to feel really bad about it. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so w the thing that was striking to me was sort of this lack of uh, willingness to accept that what we were building was something that could do things like make decisions and often make life and death decisions. Um, and we were, we, I was seeing a resistance not based upon um, an understanding of technology, but based upon an unwillingness to accept that the technology was beginning to encroach upon them. So I've got these three things in my head all the time, and they are really annoying. Sometimes they go out to dinner, they chat, come back, talk to me about what they've been t thinking about, but they are always there. The, there's the science here, there's an engineering here, and then there's a world of safety here. Um, and I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm, I'm going to get to this, don't worry. I've, I've like 200 slides here, it's great. Uh, um, I want to talk to you about um, uh, safety and actually ethics and safety. So I actually don't work on ethics. Uh, so I've got the Center, for, I, I direct the Center for Advancing Safety of machine intelligence. And I don't work on ethics, because I, there, are, there are people who work on ethics who are associated with CASME, um, but that's not what I do. And the reason why I don't work on ethics is, the, is because I'm inspired in my work by uh, um, a lovely uh, statement by Andrew Ng. Andrew Ng, um, uh, the, uh, one of the great drivers of uh, machine learning, um, at one point said, and, and I agree with this completely, AI is the new electricity, right? And his notion was, look, it's going to be a utility. It will be everywhere. Um, and now we'll test that as a theory. <laughs> Who here has interacted with ChatGPT? All right. Who hasn't? You should. It's, it'll be good for you. Uh, it'll be good for you. Um, 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 uh, it's already the new electricity. But the funny thing is, is that um, everybody thinks that, oh, it's, a, it's like a utility, it's like electricity, it'll be every there, everywhere, it will do great, great things for us. But it's not, that's what, not where we are. AI is the new electricity, but the new electricity from 128 years ago. So 128 years ago, it was great. Um, uh, there was the Chicago Expo. Um, uh, one of the great World Fair. Um, Westinghouse ran wires and lights. There were tens of thousands of lights. And we finally got to see what electricity meant. There were lights. There, were, there was refrigeration in the middle of the summer. A miracle. There were motors running without any uh, internal combustion. It was unbelievable. And everybody looked at electricity and knew that it was the future. It would change everything. And then some wires heated up. And they burst into flame. Twelve people died and then another four people died. So 16 people died. And what did we do? Did we decide to work on ethical Electricity? No. We decided that electricity was something we wanted because we could see its benefits, but we had to actually fix one problem, one problem, and that was we had to make it 
safe. We had to make it such that it did not harm. And the ethical questions follow from that. But the reality was is that we did not know how it could harm people. Uh, so we saw, as a result of this, the establishment of certainly electrical engineering as a field. We saw work in material science. We saw work in city layout. We saw work in, in architecture. We saw work in human factors, all because we were trying to make this thing safe. And for you to understand how not safe it was, it used to be you would buy a lamp, and at the end of the wire were two pieces of raw copper. And you would screw the lamp down, you would screw those pieces of raw copper down into what was functionally an outlet with a screwdriver. That's where we were. And we realized, oh, we could invent plugs. So we changed things to accommodate electricity while trying to make it safe. And that is where we are with AI right now. We are in a place where we don't even know the ways in which it can hurt people. That is, it turns out that if you have a huge electrical station, that's great. But there actually is electromagnetic energy coming out of that station, and we're not quite sure what it does to people. We still don't quite know what it does to people. Um, um, we, we tried so hard, though, to make it safe that being safe was part of the culture of electricity. It's part of the culture of, uh, of product development, things that use electricity. Um, it's, something, it's not something you think about. It's not you, like you have an office of, of, of electrical safety. Of electrical safety. You, that's what you do for a living. That's part of what you do. And that, for me, is in my bones what we should do with AI. So, given that, um, I build intelligent machines. Um, I, have, I have always, always loved the promise of machine intelligence, um, even though we are convinced that they're going to kill us all. Um, uh, the number of ways in which machines have decided to kill us all in popular media is, is fantastic. Um, uh, it, it, first of all, it takes over the world and makes us all sit in chairs quietly, because um, then we'll be safer. Um, uh, it, it takes over our weapons and blows us all up. Uh, uh, <laughs> it takes over our jobs and enslaves us. It turns us in, uh, in the matrix into batteries, um, uh, just because it can. Um, so we have, uh, we have, we have a, a history of, this is not, uh, the AI is not going to be good for us, but we have to proceed. And the reason why I proceed is because I actually believe the question of intelligence is fundamental. And it's one of the three big questions that we have to answer in the world. Uh, the first is, uh, what's the nature of the physical world? How does this work? What's the nuts and bolts of nuts and bolts? Um, uh, how do things function at the, uh, at the atomic level, at the level of forces, um, uh, giving us physics and chemistry, astrophysics? A huge, a huge array of questions we have to answer. On top of that is what's the nature of the biological world? Uh, that is, how is it that life can even exist? And how is it that we, 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 got, we were lucky um, and we, that we had mechanisms for replicating themselves that were ever so slightly wrong, which meant that we could have evolution, we could have change. How does that, what's the what are the mechanisms of that? And then the third is cognition. What's the nature of intelligence? How does intelligence work? Now, you can go two ways with that. You can study people, um, which I have a, 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 I'm a huge fan of. I like people. Um, some of my best friends are people. Um, uh, but um, you can't really do, there are limits to what you can do with people. And by nature, I'm a designer and a developer. Um, and so uh, I took the other route and thought of what's the nature of machine intelligence. And machine intelligence is something that you don't discover. You design. You build. And that's exciting to me. And for me, that means that uh, going back to the early, the first, really the first definition of AI, it's looking at systems that perform actions that are performed by humans would be considered intelligent. Which is a little um, circular in de definition because we have to now talk about what makes people intelligent. And the thing that makes us so smart, though, is uh, our, the things that make us so smart are, are astounding. 
Um, we make decisions, we understand language, we draw conclusions about the world, we recognize situations. Somebody walking in here and looks at this room, they go, oh, it's some dude giving a talk, which is not a trivial thing to figure out. <laughs> but, you know, you move on. Um, uh, we can explain the past. That is, we can look at what has happened, and with our knowledge of how the world works, we can actually create explanations for what we've seen before. We can actually, actually recognize what's going on and understand the present, and then we can plan for and predict the future. And in fact, we are little prediction engines. That's all we do for a living, is we predict. We predict what's going to happen next, and we respond to that prediction. But for me, the biggie is that we use language, uh, because language is something super special. Um, you can teach a dog all sorts of tricks. Crows use tools. Beavers and ants build buildings, right? They do all those things. They're great. But human beings are the only things in the world, and I still, and I would say that persists today, are the only things in the world that can look at a situation, figure out what's going on, think about it, and turn their heads and look at someone else and explain it to that person. That is miraculous. That is unbelievable. Um, and leads me to a moment where we're going to talk about my favorite sentence. Um, and, uh, and then we're probably going to jump to 33. Uh, that's 33, 31, 69 are my three numbers. Um, my favorite sentence, because I want you to understand what I mean when I say language is astounding. Um, my favorite sentence is Mary Smith. Mary Smith is Stanford's premier roboticist. Mary Smith is Stanford's premier roboticist. Mary Smith is Stanford's premier roboticist. So I have a question for you. And, and I want you to answer the question as though it's a real question and not an academic question. Is Mary Smith smart? Yes or no? Good. Um, uh, uh, sometimes I'll be talking to lawyers and I'll give them this question. They'll go, well, you know, it could go either way. And then you have to do, and then it turns out that the sentence itself is the retort to that. So you say, Mary Smith is Stanford's premier roboticist. Is she smart? Well, I don't know. She's a Stanford premier roboticist, right? So it's pretty clear. Is she ambitious? It's oddly enough an easier question than whether or not she's smart. Is she ambitious? All right. Um, at the end of the day on a Friday, it's 8 o'clock because she works late, um, uh, Mary Smith decides to on her way home, stop at a bar and get a cocktail. Can she be served? Yeah. Does anyone say no? Does anyone say, I don't know? Who says, I don't know? Okay, I'm gonna give, I'm, I'll give it to you. Why? Why don't you know? She's premier roboticist. Is a student a premier roboticist at Stanford? Probably not. Let me put it this way, just so you know. Do you know how many, um, how many people, uh, the, how many faculty members are in STEM fields? How many, how many faculty members at universities are in STEM fields um, um, who are under the age of 21? None. Uh, so it's more likely that it's, I'm sorry, but it's more likely that a shark will, 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 will wander its way uh, on the land and eat Mary Smith for dinner uh, than she will not be 21 and, and can't get a drink. The thing is, is that that's all sitting there in that sentence. Um, actually, it's sitting there in that sentence plus your knowledge of the world. Um, just so you, if you want to, you can actually type in Mary Smith is uh, Stanford's premier roboticist and ask if she's smart to uh, one of the, any language model you want to use. And depending upon the model, it'll either say, I don't know, um, or it'll say, that's an opinion, and I'm not giving opinions. Um, you ask if, you can, if she can have a drink. Um, my favorite answer is, there's nothing about her being, uh, having status at Stanford that makes her deserve a drink at a bar, and it's like, no, there's nothing, but she's old. I was wondering if she's old enough. Um, my point here is that um, a language is not the, just the words that you're seeing, that you're looking at, 
the words that you have looked at ever so slightly before, or even the patterns of language that you've learned. Um, the uh, language is a rich world of inference. And I want to talk about language generation, and I'm going to do this as quickly as I can, because I want to show you something, and then we're going to go to what I really want to talk about. Um, uh, uh, these are some numbers. This is a table with some numbers. Um, um, uh, it's a decent table. Um, uh, here's a, um, another set of numbers to go along with it. Um, uh, uh, they are uh, numbers having to do with uh, sales of two products, uh, ID uh, uh, 0075 and ID 0078. Uh, colloquially, the overly large widget and the small light widget. Um, marketing really had a hard time with these names, um, but they got to them. Um, um, any one of you looking at these uh, tables um, after about you know, a couple minutes would be able to figure out what's going on in the world and tell me. What's more important for me is that you can get a machine to do it. Um, um, and you can have a machine tell you uh, while slightly better than sales of the small light widget, sales of the overly large widget have been on the decline over the past year. During the same period, sales of the small light widget have been steadily improving, based upon that data. Now, um, this is a, an example of uh, natural language generation, ever so slightly old school in this instance. Um, um, uh, and the notion of, L, uh, of natural language generation was always that, oh, we'll have some facts about the world, and then we can use a language generator to turn those facts into language so we can understand them. Um, there was a time when almost anyone who was doing NAI had a natural language generator that they'd written just so they didn't have to look at their own data. The system could tell you what it was doing. It was like, yeah. And it was never included in anyone's dissertation. It was just a thing you did. Um, uh, the thing is, is that if you were thinking about this and from the point of view of facts, the question is, in this, where are the facts? There are no facts here. Um, uh, the, the facts don't exist in the data alone. The facts exist because um, you know that a quarter is a time, you know that these are entities, you know that um, in the other table those entities map onto names of entities, and you know that um, how much the sales are um, is a metric. You know that. So you bring not, and this isn't a schema for the data, this is your relate, you're knowing what the, these things relate to the world. This is what, how, does the, how does this data relate to the world, map onto the world? And once you know that, then you can do things like generate sales of the overly large widget have been on the decline over the past year. Um, and the reason why you want this is because I got to tell you, we got a lot of data. And I, I, I'm, there's a, 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 a thing that's super important to understand. The data that we produce today is the equivalent of 500 books of text for every man, woman, and child on the planet every single goddamn day. And so it's like, oh yeah, let's get some data scientists to look at that. Um, it ain't gonna happen. And so we need to, if we are gonna open up things, and there's a, this will get us there, we need to be able to take the data that we have and start generating things. And I'm not gonna go into details about what this is generated, but this is essentially a performance review, which turns out to be 80% of the documents that we produce in business, certainly. Um, of uh, an individual based upon this data. Um, and the thing is, is that if you had to do a performance review of somebody, you would be able to sit down and figure out how to actually do it, wouldn't you? I mean, if you're looking at a student, it's what their grades are. Are they, are they how are they ranking? Are they doing better or worse? What's their target, right? You, you know how to do this, and the systems that we're building know how to do this. And so they know about how to map not only um, the data onto what's happening in the world, but then give it some voice. Let's take a look at Helen Crane's performance this quarter. But this is today. Helen's performance this quarter has been exceptional, putting her at the top of her team. Helen closed $191,242 in sales with 93 deals and an average deal size of $2,056. For both deal number and total sales, Helen was at the top of her team. She was also- But you know about Helen by now. Let's talk a bit about sales. During the third quarter of 2013, 60 agents drove nearly $1,182,000 in sales with an average close of $1,582 against 747 deals. This was a 13% increase over Q2, but only a 6% increase compared to Q1. The top three agents this quarter were Louise Parker, closing deals totaling nearly $195,000. Terry Hamilton, 
with $72,688 in sales, and Harold Murray at $65,989. There were nine agents, 15% of the sales team, who had absolutely no impact on sales, while there were three, 5% of the team, who actually had negative impact. They had to give back money. I mean, it goes without saying that these are not human beings, right? These, this is all generated. Um, uh, the text is, uh, the text comes from, the data, uh, the data goes into analysis, the analysis goes into text, the text goes into uh, text-to-speech, and then uh, these two avatars are happily talking about things. And now, remember, I got the three things in my head, right? I got, I got oh, uh, there's no aspect of human cognition that we cannot bring to the machine. You have to do it now. Do it now. Build something now that someone will want. And then the third thing that's going, make it safe? Uh, so make it safe. This is the beginnings of making it safe. Um, um, there's a whole bunch of really great data out there. This is uh, one of my favorite examples, and this is from a long time ago now, I just realized. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, Chicago has, up and down the lakefront, um, uh, sampling systems that pull on uh, water. Um, and uh, they um, uh, allow you to tell what the quality of the water is on all the beaches. Uh, they're pulled once an hour. Uh, they send it to a central location. Chicago is an open data city, so the data is published. And on any given day, um, uh, there are maybe two dozen people who know enough about data, enough about the sensors, enough about how to determine water quality, enough to know about analytics to be able to tell you anything about the beaches. That's it. Maybe, maybe, maybe two dozen. Um, but you can take that data and you can For do the this. ending July 16th, 2016. 63rd Street Beach was the cleanest beach in Chicago, as measured by the cloudiness of the water. Ohio Street Beach was the dirtiest beach in Chicago, as measured by the overall turbidity of the water. Beachgoers would be advised to visit Oak Street Beach that had a better than average cleanliness rating this week. So, two dozen, two dozen, 24 people can understand it. Or, I don't know, 8 million? 8 million who include people who want to take their kids to the beach and they want to know what's safe. So this isn't making AI safe. This is making something the rest of the world safe with AI. Um, uh, but it's the notion that our job and this is, the, for me, always the starting point in all these discussions. Our job is to be thinking about who can we help? What, what, is, the, what is the good we can do? Um, and that gets you from, I'm telling you about Helen's sales figures, to I'm telling you where you should take your kids today. Um, I'm, I'm going to show you about 10 seconds of Elizabeth. Um, this gets embodied in a lot of forms. Um, but this is my current favorite. Um, what you're about to see is a recording of a Zoom meeting. Uh, I'm on the Zoom meeting, and then there's something else on the Zoom meeting. And uh, we call her Elizabeth. Uh, she has her own machine. You can send her email with an invite to a Zoom meeting, and she'll log on and come to the Zoom meeting, and, uh, and she'll just be this. The avatar who is with me is an example of innovation driven by user needs. The easiest way to explain this is to have her introduce herself. Elizabeth? Hello, everyone. I'm Elizabeth, a conversational AI model developed by undergraduates at Northwestern University as part of a theater project. My capabilities include speech-to-text, realistic avatars, search, text-to-speech, as well as the GPT-4 API. Recently, MSAI students integrated me into Zoom, allowing me to participate in online meetings. I also have the ability to switch between different information contexts. All right, I'm not gonna let you, I, she's, she's, I love her. I love listening to her. Uh, um, um, uh, but, um, well, actually, I'm gonna, but I'm gonna talk ever so briefly about, um, I don't know how to make her, I can make her stop. The avatar who is- I want to talk ever so briefly though about- driven by user needs. 
the easiest way to explain this is to have her. Um, uh, it was interesting. So uh, she mentioned, she rattled off what she uses. Uh, the platform she's sitting on is like five years old at this point. Um, uh, so she could have been around a while ago. Um, um, and in the back end, uh, she does use, um, uh, she does use, in this instance, um, uh, GPT-4 as a generator, but uh, the generation of the language itself is, um, is relatively small compared to the rest of the system. Um, that is, the rest of the system is using a combination of different kinds of approaches. Uh, it's, using, uh, uh, it's using RAG, it's using the same kind of analysis and then facts approach uh, that I showed you before. Um, uh, it does some stuff with, um, uh, with just frequently asked questions. And all she does is sit there and listen. Um, and um, uh, unlike other, um, unlike other um, uh, personal assistants associated, certainly was associated with Zoom, but unlike other personal assistants, she doesn't wait for you to tell her, uh, call her name. She's always listening. Um, and when she uh, has a piece of information that's useful for you, um, um, uh, not in this, but, uh, but now, she raises her hand, which is to say she'll only talk when she's got something good for you, when she knows uh, what she's got. And the thing that, is, I, that I love about her, and it's important in terms of the way I think about the world, is she is what we call truth preserving. That is to say, the nature of the way in which she functions is that she will not speak. She will not participate unless what she's got is actually grounded in some level of ground truth that she has access to. Um, all right. So for me, we are in the world where we now transform this thing, data that you do not want to see ever, 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 um, uh, to this. That is something that can communicate in a form that we actually uh, appreciate and enjoy um, and actually is focused on language as communication. All right. All right. I have, I have, I have different ways I can go now. Um, um, I want to talk briefly about this because this is important um, in terms of uh, we keep thinking, um, I, I spend a, a more time than I want uh, talking to people on the policy side. And, and they keep saying the same thing. And I, I just do love this. They keep saying the same thing. And that thing is, oh, my God, it's happening so fast. It's happening so fast. And we, we, we're just struggling to keep up with it. Um, and for me, it's like, well, that's great. So there's this one thing that you haven't figured out yet, and nobody else has figured it out either. That's okay. That's happening really fast. By the way, have you got any regulations around recommendation systems? No. Well, you know, those have been around for 30 years, and I can tell you exactly what they do to people. Um, uh, um, are you really working hard on regulations about um, uh, uh, controlling the rise of depression in young women ages of 13 to 23 because of social media and, in fact, the tools that we have created? Um, the tools that we have created that allow them to see a world which is so much better than theirs because it's edited? No. All right. Uh, have you got anything about um, uh, addiction, digital addiction? You've been working on that. I mean, uh, there's the business model of engagement, which, uh, and if engagement, when you realize, when you think about it, for even, I don't know, 15 seconds, you realize that engagement is uh, uh, the first step to addiction. No, we're not working on that. You realize that these are all old technologies, that you've just been sitting on your ass waiting for people to die. Um, uh, no, we didn't realize that. Um, what are you working on? Transparency. Do you have any idea what that means? No. Ex explanation. Do you have any idea what that means? No. Do you understand what depression is based upon you see a world that is so much better than your world? Um, uh, that you are reminded constantly over and over again that you were not doing as well as other people? Do you understand that? Yes, I do. Could you think about that for a minute and get us there? Um, uh, um, and the reason why I've got this, and we're going to touch on this a little bit, 
is because every, everywhere, it's not just that AI is coming, it's not an emerging technology, it's not something new. Um, um, the particular embodiment in uh, large language models is the power we have figured out based upon them is, but you have interacted with AI a dozen times today. A dozen, at least. Um, and the reality is, is that we still are not thinking for new technology, for any technologies, we are not thinking, what does it do? What does it do for us? What do we need? That is, what do we need to give it? And then where are the risks? We just don't think about that that way. Um, at best, we think about what does it do for us without even considering what it really does. And for me, and we're gonna skip some of these now, because I, I already told you this. It's important to understand that we now have, we are on the verge of self-driving cars, um, um, all driven by um, uh, 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 systems that were created by taking a look at the data that we have and learning from it. Um, we are now looking at a world of smart factories where the, the, the huge issues of logistics we can actually take and start making predictions around, and we can make predictions around whether or not machines are gonna go down on a factory floor. So the day before they go down, we can pull them out and replace them. That means we can always be up and running, which is huge. Um, and then uh, predictive insurance. We now have, and you've seen commercials for this. Um, um, you, put, you clip a little thing into your car, and, you, and your car radios back to your insurance company, what your driving performance looks like, um, you get lower rates just by doing that. And you get lower rates if you drive carefully. Um, um, and if you're not driving carefully, you can get advice about how you can lower your rates by driving carefully. So insurance has always been a world of, of numbers and actuarial tables, but now we're hooked into them. Um, and the notion here is that we can turn industry into a different kind, of, I mean, we can turn insurance into a different kind of industry, where instead of I give you money and when I mess up, you give me a lot of money, into I'll give you money and you will make sure I don't mess up. And for driving, for health, uh, for even starting a business, the notion of being able to track who you are, what you are and where you're doing and provide you with service is fantastic. But um, that means that we can be predicted and we can be absorbed. With current technology, this is not even, this is not like clever technology, current technology. And in fact, there was a, uh, I went through a, a, a tour of the robotics lab, and this is unfortunately what the way my head works now. Um, and there was a discussion of uh, uh, teaching robots to notice the subtle movements, uh, the subtle movements that a human being uh, goes through when they're changing direction. So the robots, so right now the robots will come really close to you because they're not sure where you're going to go. Um, but if they know where you can go, they can go to where they think you're going to go. And that sounds great, because then the robot isn't embarrassingly almost bumping into you in the hallway and then going, oh, okay. And it's, it's like, oh, well, no, I know where you're going to go. And it's, it's very much the, uh, uh, the, 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 ho the hockey uh, advice, and that is you want to go, you go where, to where the puck is going to be, not to where the puck is. And this is the problem with me and that. That's a great... Um, uh, that's a great behavior to teach a machine uh, when it's wandering the halls with you. It's also what you teach a machine for is tracking you. Uh, um, that is to say that it can be, a, this is a predator skill as well as a uh, wandering through the hallway skill. Um, and we keep thinking, all of the, we keep seeing these clever things without thinking about um, what they are going to do next uh, uh, for us. Um, uh, I was surrounded by people at, an, at, a, at a meeting where they'd been to MIT and they'd seen this wonderful demo of how you could get insert someone into like a, um, uh, a, uh, uh, into a top gun. And it was, this insertion was seamless. And it's like, oh, geez, yeah, no, I know, it's great. That, that's fantastic. You're so excited. That, I, I'm, I mean, I, I love it too. It's really fun. Um, you know you can use that same technology to build a little Zoom person like me, like, like I've built, um, but it's going to be based upon your CEO's face and his voice, and it'll be in a Zoom meeting, and you'll control it, and it'll tell you to, uh, mod to, to uh, transfer funds from one account to another offshore account, and those funds will be in the order of $150 million, 
That's the way you can do with it. It's like, oh, that's the, you, oh, Pasha, you know, that's the future. No, that happened two weeks ago. Um, um, uh, we are now, uh, as we're looking at where we're going, for every single piece of technology you see, you, honest to God, you have to get over the excitement for just a, just a minute, just a minute, and think, what is, wait a second, uh, because uh, the wait a second will happen. But it's not just for the new ones. We've had statistical machine learning forever. We've had deep learning for a long time. Um, uh, Evidence-based reasoning like Watson, uh, recommendation systems. Um, we've just had them forever. Um, and we're still not looking at them with regard to that one question. What are the risks? Where is the harm? Um, and we need to do that, not because we don't love the technologies, I love these technologies. I love AI. I think AI, and anyone can ask me after, after I'm done ranting uh, what I mean, I love AI, um, and I think AI can change us as a species, but only if we decide to make it safe. Ah, and then this happened. Oh, <laughs> a glorious moment where um, uh, we got the launch of a technology that had been around for a while, but not quite in this form. Um, that was so compelling and so exciting that everyone had to talk about it. It's the best technology in the world. Um, it's a stupid technology. So we got the hype and we got the skeptics. And of course, it will kill you. <laughs> it will kill you. There's never been a time in AI where there hasn't been somebody saying, excuse me, it's going to kill you. And it's like, why? Because once you're super intelligent, you realize that you don't like human beings. And it's like, do you like human beings? No, I guess I don't. It's this odd thing of the, the obvious conclusion of being really smart um, uh, uh, and having goals is that you want to wipe us off the planet. And I, I swear, we, this has been the, we have had this all the time. Um, uh, AI is going to be great. AI is nothing. It's just total BS. Um, AI is going to kill us all. Um, uh, and normally I would say, come on, you know, there's some truth in here. You know, everyone, and I mean everyone, everyone is wrong. <laughs> Not anymore. Not anymore. Because what we've, what we've got is we got the hype, and then we got people responding to the hype instead of the technology, and then people worrying about the hype instead of the te technology. And then we had a whole bunch of really, really respected uh, scientists and uh, practitioners telling us that we had to worry about the existential threat. Um, um, and uh, again, when, I'm, when Peter and I are sitting down, we should talk about what I consider, what, what I think about the existential threat question. Um, because it's not just going to kill us. It's not going to kill us. Um, but it's incredibly powerful. Um, it, it's incredibly powerful. It's a tool that was um, designed to generate language, not to use it the way we use it, but to generate language. Um, and, and be seductively, I mean, seduct so seductive that in fact, uh, even. Um, OpenAI did not quite see it coming, um, uh, uh, but um, it's so easy to use, and it's so marvelous to be able to type something in, and it just comes back with stuff. Um, and the answers look so good and so sweet and so wonderful. They're often just completely wrong. Uh, um, uh, and I, I mean, the, the, uh, I, 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 every week I ask for a bio of my dad, who was a Middle Eastern archaeologist. They're always really good. I mean, they're really good. And I, I, have, a, I have a collection of bios of, uh, that are just like, he was such an impressive man. He didn't exist um, um, because they're all wrong, uh, but uh, they're seductive. So I want to make sure we remember what they do. Um, um, uh, and so this is with me having a little bit of an interaction here. Chicago is often called the Windy. Chicago was famous for its deep dish. Personally, I prefer buffalo chicken. Yeah, uh, that's what it does. It just that it does it, uh, not by not with just the next word, but with the whole damn paragraph and paragraph after paragraph. Um, but all it's doing, and this is, it's important to have this in your bones at some, at some level. All it's doing is guessing the next word. And I say, all it's doing is guessing the next word, and then I'll, 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 take out all, I'll take out the all. 
It's guessing the next word. That's it. It turns out that that ends up being outrageously powerful if you have enough words to begin with and enough words that you've trained on. Um, but it's not a search engine, a repository of facts, a database, a system for reasoning, or an analytics engine. It is a language engine, a fluency engine, um, a, and a, a taxonomy engine. Um, uh, and, oh, wow, this, got, this, 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 this suffered a little bit in the translation from my machine to this machine. Um, but it is the thing that you've got to really get your, you get your arms around, is that it is a transformational technology. Um, uh, and, uh, and then I'm going to do, I'm going to go, I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to uh, 205. Is that okay? Well, um, um, when, when do we finish? When do we end? Oh, oh then, then we should stop. We should stop. You can, and then we'll give, because I'm sure everybody wants to ask you questions. All right, we'll, we'll get to it. This is probably the most important uh, uh, thing to see. This is what I do for a living. I work with these people. Um, there's my lab, but then there's all these other people across the university. And the reason why I work with them um, is to get to this. And that is, as you're looking at AI and what it does in the world, you have to look at other fields. Because it's not going to do something in the world for us, for, AI, for computer science. It might. But it's going to do something for others. And when you start thinking about others, it's easy when you're in computer science to think that what you're going to go in is you're going to tell them the great stuff you're going to do for them, and then you realize, oh, the word is not for, the preposition is not for there. It's really the great stuff you're going to do to them. We're going to colonize you. We're going to take you over. Um, and our starting point in terms of working with all these areas is not that. It's the idea of its partnership. It's not colonization. But you have to always think about problem solving from the point of view of their goals and their needs. Um, um, you want to turn disruption into this notion of transformation and amplification. Um, and that means if I'm in the law, I have to ask the question, why do you exist as a field? And the law exists as a field because we were going to give people access to justice. Um, and we don't do that. And so why don't we try to have AI help in that? Um, when you look at medicine, um, it's, it's actually a, a, a healthy citizenry and personalized medicine. Um, uh, when we're looking at, at, at journalism, it's an informed citizenry. And it's all about finding those goals and values and attaching yourself to those instead of the application in the moment that you can build. All right. And I'm going to leave this here because this is what I worry about every single damn day. Social media depression, digital addiction, dark patterns where I know I can convince you to make a decision you don't want to make, and it's easy. I mean, it's easy, and it's, it's, it's reproducible. Um, people not getting jobs because uh, the job recommendation system doesn't think they want that job. Um, um, uh, people not getting jobs because the resume system reviewed them and pushed them aside. Um, uh, people staying in prison. Uh, because there's a system that's making guesses as to what, how, uh, what's the likelihood of them committing another crime and their parole not going through. Um, and then information balkanization, which was our first great sin. That is the use of the, the technology of similarity uh, to decide what news you would get. And that turned into information balkanization, information weaponization, and the world of division we have today. And then, of course, the erosion of agency, of human agency based upon recommendation systems, which always seems fun when you think about, so I don't make the right decision about Netflix, until you realize that 7% of the relationships being, permanent relationships being formed in this country today were mediated by the machine. Um, and if it's telling you who to marry, uh, then you really should understand how it works. Um, so that's it. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to sit down. I'm sorry I went along, Peter. It's my way. <laughs> Thank you. So thanks, Chris, for a fantastic, uh, fantastic talk. And, they're uh, a quiet audience, by the way. Yeah, well, they're, they're, they're a little subdued. You know, they'll, they'll, get, they'll get their chance. In fact, I'm going to apologize in advance that we might steal five minutes from the next break to, to give the audience a chance. I'm going to... Um, 
take my prerogative. I have 20 questions I could ask you. I'm going to ask two, and then I'm going to open it up to, to people to come to the microphones and, uh, and ask you two. So, so you opened up, Chris, with, with saying uh, that as AI scientists, we want to bring everything we do to the machine. And I don't know if you remember my, one of the first assignments you, you gave me. I was an uh, undergrad, very proud of myself to be admitted to your graduate class. Um, and you told us, develop a theory for what's going on in your mind when you park your car at the shopping mall and you remember where it was when, when you come back out of the store. And it's a, a different place every single day. Develop a theory about that and implement it in a program. I wanted to, and, you know, and then I proceeded to ignore all my other classes and do this for the next week or two and, uh, you know, and, and stay up all night and, and, and um, stuck with me. Two questions about this. One is, you say we're going to bring everything to the machine. What do you think is going to be the last aspect of human intelligence? What's the last pillar that's going to fall um, in terms of machines being able to bring it to the machine? Uh, because as you said, ChatGPT is not smarter than us. There's still, there still are some, some things we're better at than the machines. And also, what's the role of, of computer science, computing, in this third question of yours, what's the nature of intelligence? Why, why are we looking at this? Why are people like you and I looking at this not as neuroscientists or psychologists, but as computer scientists to understand intelligence? Um, those are good questions. Uh, I think the last thing that's going to fall is integration. Uh, so we had just you know before before deep learning and and you know the massive success of statistical methods um, uh, we thought everything was going to be semantically based and we were going to craft some craft rules and handcrafted stuff it was a stupid idea but it's all we had um, and then um, we had statistical methods and those really really took hold and they really really are taking hold now um, and but then you look at what um, um, the, you know, the failings of the, of the language models in particular, and you realize, oh, the failings are because they don't, they don't know what they're talking about. They really don't know what they're talking about. And, and but the, right now, everyone's trying to fix it inside those boxes because they don't, because they want to win. And they don't think in terms of, oh, no, we won here, but now there's another, there are other components that we want to bring to bear to help us win the whole game. And I want you to think about when you learn, when you learn a new thing, you will put together a plan for learning it. Um, and my favorite version of this is flashcards, where you on one side of a flashcard, you write a question, and the other side, you write, you know, an answer. Um, um, it's great for language learning. It's like banana. Oh, it's whatever it is in French. Um, I guess it's, uh, um, um, oh, potato, uh, pomme de terre. Oh, that's great. And you wrote it down in one side and wrote it down the other side and you stack them up and you run through it and, and you have a plan to train yourself. And I want you to think about that phrase. You have a plan to train yourself, to train yourself, which means there's one component of you that's doing a job to teach the other component of you how to do something. We have the other component now, I think. Um, and now we've got to figure out how to train it. Um, and I think the, the um, two-hop question answering, uh, which is my favorite thing, um, um, uh, uh, how do I put this? Uh, uh, if you were trying to answer the question of uh, who was president when George Clooney was born, um, you'd have to know when George Clooney was born uh, in order to answer the other question. So it's two questions in there. Um, this was a, a problem for, uh, uh, for the, uh, the, the chat GPT models uh, at the beginning, but then they got trained, they got chain of thought training, um, and they got trained to when they see questions of certain kinds, how to decompose it and write the first answer down first. It's always wonderful. Yeah, they have to write it down because they have to have had its own input. And the, the, everyone was so excited. Oh, look, it can do two-hop reasoning now. And it's like, no, 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 no. What you should be looking at is what was the process that you went through to identify the problem, figure out what the training corpus would look like, and then train the system. Because that's a component of intelligence that's not over here. Um, and that's the thing I think that's going to, and, and it's not going to, and we're not going to do it because Everyone wants to be the winner, and though you don't, you're not a winner if you built one great component of something that's bigger than you are. You, uh, they want everyone wants to be the winner of no, the one thing won. Um, that's the uh, that's the killer. What was the second half? The second was why computer science and not neuroscience and psychology for understanding the nature of intelligence. I think that um, we're going to need. I, I think it's less neuroscience and more psychology. Um, I think in the long run, we've got to realize that human beings, I mean, I, honest to God, and, and this is, a, I, I will say this again, 
human beings are marvelous. We are, but we are a collection of, 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 of relatively serviceable heuristics combined with a complete and utter misunderstanding of statistics. <laughs> I mean, we are like goofballs. Um, it is astounding that we're alive, that we can survive, that we can get through the day. Um, I mean, I'm amazed by it, but we have to accommodate that when we think about AI. And I'm a huge fan of how to build, uh, of thinking about AI systems that can be built to bring out the best of us, um, uh, to not depend upon statistical knowledge, but to bring out the best of us and have our reasoning be improved by the systems. Um, and uh, so it's psychology, less neuroscience, and, uh, but thinking in terms of a larger system, not just the model itself. Great, so I'm gonna ask one more question. If you wanna ask a question to Chris, feel free to come to one of the microphones. Um, so you bemoaned in some way that, that policymakers have been ignoring the progress in artificial intelligence for 30 years and, can, and computing for, you know, for 30 years. They, these are not new things. Um, and there's been problems to solve that haven't been solved over a long period of time. For better or for worse, we have their attention now. There's, you know, everybody is focusing on what do we need to do to, to, uh, to make AI safe. Um, what should we be doing to, to take advantage of this moment? Is this a good thing, first of all, or were we better off when people, you know, when, when, uh, when um, it was being ignored? Is, is, is that part of your point? Or is it a good thing that, that people are paying attention and uh, we have an opportunity to do something? What, what should we do? How should we respond to this moment? I, I, I think it's a really good thing they're paying attention. Unfortunately, I worry that they're paying attention to the wrong thing. Um, and, uh, and they are paying, they're, they're I mean, I, I, I believe in, in, you know, concerns about, you know, privacy and um, uh, privacy and the utilization of our data. These are all important issues. Uh, but there are, there are very specific harms that exist today um, uh, that, um, uh, that we, we're for the most part ignoring and we don't know how to regulate against. I think what's going to happen is that we're going to see, um, I, I love Illinois. Illinois uh, is suing Meta uh, for um, uh, making kids depressed. I mean, it's like, that's what they're suing them for. And they're right. And I think that's what's going to, we're going to see lawsuits and then it's going to turn into regulation. But everybody, I mean, it's, uh, how do I put it? Um, when you worry about what AI is going to, you know, what the, where the harms are, some of the things are, some of the things look obvious. Um, and so we have people saying things like, well, we can't have models that are biased. It's like, it's like, no, there ain't no such thing as a model that's not biased. The, the nature of the way they learn, are, it's a bit of bias. It's like what you have to ask is, who's, who's going to get hurt? Just ask that question. Just ask that question. And if every time we, we, we look at a tech down, say, who's it going to hurt? Who's it going to hurt? And, and make regulators ask that question. And because we can walk in with technologies now and say, I can give you a list of names of people who have been hurt by this. And, and the list is short. So, and, and, but we, it's flashy and new. So uh, Taylor Swift. There was a huge brouhaha because of deep fake pornography around Taylor Swift. Everyone was like upset. She's suing, uh, she's trying to sue some people. We're like, oh, this is a horrible thing. There are about 10,000 deep, deep fake pornography sites that exist today. Hundreds of thousands of women have been humiliated and degraded by this technology. And we're like, well, but you know, we didn't know about it until Taylor Swift popped up. And now that we've, se we've, we've seen it pop up, well, we wanna make sure that celebrities cannot be part of these systems. And it's like, that's who you want to protect. You want to protect the people who are the easiest to protect, who protect themselves. Why not actually look at what these things are really doing, who they're doing it to, and how we can fix it? Um, and that's, for me, the place where, and, and I got to tell you, when I rattle this off, I, and this is the most depressing thing in the world, I rattle this off, I'll be at a thing, and I'll rattle this off, and people say, well, that's very pessimistic. It's like, no, it's not. <laughs> This is like you're walking down the street and you see someone bleeding to death because they've been gut shot and saying, we've got to take this person to the hospital. It goes, oh, no, you're, that's, so, that's so pessimistic. Uh, and it's like, no, it's not. There's, there's real harm here. And I think elevating the real harm and making it clear that the harms are, you know, exactly how extreme the harms are, I think is, that's the next step. Um, that's kind of, and, and uh, I try to be, I'm calmer usually.
you're an academic audience. I get to be like crazed, um, um, but go ahead, please. Wonderful talk, Dr. Hammond. And I wanted to ask, when you were going through your slides, there was a section on data sets and how we now have like the problem of getting data in order to train and in order to make these uh, systems smart and you know to give them the experience that they need. And I know that a really big thing that's coming up currently in data sets and you know making data for machines to be trained on is synthetic data and how we are trying to extrapolate from small sets of data into large sets of data in order to give machines enough to train on. Um, I think that this is like a topic that may or may not like be a big thing that could really change the like trajectory of how we view the ethics of these, you know, uh, machine learning algorithms. And I kind of wanted to get your take on that. It depends upon the, uh, it depends upon the, it depends upon the data, how it's generated and what it's being used for. So um, uh, uh, we have a system that's, a, that's, the, that's, the, that's behind Elizabeth um, uh, called uh, Saturn. And what you do is you drop a data set in, it looks at that data set, um, and it, it looks at that data set, it looks at its analytical skills, and it can generate the set of questions it can now answer about the world based upon this data and its analytical abilities. Um, and then we generate, for every single one of those questions, as many variants of that question, a syntactic and, and sometimes slightly semantic um, variants of that question, so we can train a system. Um, but that's controlled, and, um, and it's because we know that the distribution of questions that, um, the distributions of questions that we're looking at is different than the first round of distribution that we get. If you walk into a realm where the, what you're doing now is generating data where you're making guesses about the distribution and you're wrong and there could be, uh, there could be ill effects as a result, um, then, you're, then you're in trouble. So it really comes down to how, why are you doing, why are you generating, why, why are you doing it to begin with? Um, uh, and um, whether or not you are actually matching up the, the synthetic data with the distribution of examples in the world that are meaningful, um, and uh, and and then are we are we putting this in the you know in a we, we putting this in a, you know in a position where we're making life decisions? Um, there is this moment. I mean, <laughs> there is this moment, and for me, it's always this moment. It's like yes, we <clears throat> we need synthetic data because we need large data sets in order to train these systems. And we have these small data sets. And it's like, okay, could, could we think even for a minute about how we might be able to use the small data set more effectively? Mm. Um, and think in terms of, uh, I have a student who's just, actually just got a paper published, and I was really proud of her, on, um, on machine teaching. And that is, um, what does it mean to have an expert actually uh, with a corpus actually do a, a concerted and focused training, uh, training curriculum? for systems, and training curricula, I think, are huge. And I love that more than I like synthetic data, although I'll do it when, it's, when I think it's necessary. Thank you. Hi. I'm Hi. Sylvia. I'm a PhD student at the School of Journalism and Media, and uh, I research AI and journalism. And starting, the starting point for that was mainly the Stats Monkey and the Narrative Science back in 2009, 2011. And I've been following your work for a couple of years since when you said in 2011 in the New York Times that a Pulitzer would win uh, a prize, a Robert would win a prize, a uh, Pulitzer Prize in five years. Because I'm a good salesman. Yeah, then, <laughs> <laughs> I know. And then in 2012, in a Wired interview, you also said that in 15 years, 90% of the content published online would be written by automated uh, tools. So my question now that we are close to that 15 years. Oh yeah. <laughs> now in 2024, how do you see the use of generative AI tools in the news industry? And what kind of new journalisms you foresee in the future? I saw that you were. I, I mean, it can go, uh, it, with all of these things, it'll go two different, it can go in two different directions. Um, so I have a, um, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, I have a set of students who just were, uh, would uh, hook up to a news feed, um, uh, grab articles, um, edit the articles down, um, I mean automatically, edit the articles down, and then uh, 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 write versions of those articles that were more for a spoken word than a written word, um, and then uh, built out a much prettier version of, of an avatar 
giving the news to give to turn that into um, um, you know, like two minute news blips. Um, uh, and um, we're, I think we're going to see that's an example of what we're going to see over and over again, taking um, uh, news in one form um, and then modifying it for different kinds of audiences. Uh, on the other hand, um, there's a great Borges story called the uh, Library of Babel. Uh, and it's a library with every book that could possibly be written. And in there is an index that tells you exactly which books are truthful. And right next to that index is another index that tells you what books might be true are truthful, but it's wrong. And another one, and another one, and another one. We are about to enter that world. That is to say, the, the ability to generate content um, and the rate at which we can generate content, the huge scale of it, and I don't mean false content, but skewing the truth, um, is such that um, we are going to learn, have to learn a new set of skills as human beings. Um, and um, we are going to have to, I mean, for me, my rule of thumb is if something, is, if, if something really hits the mark in terms of uh, what I believe, it's probably wrong. <laughs> or not, uh, not true. This is, uh, and I'm, I'm, my, I'm sorry, my example was in the Steele dossier about Trump. There was the famed Trump P tape. Um, and I read that and I thought, that can't be true because I really want it to be true. <laughs> and if you really want something to be true, then you've just been delivered a piece of news that was aimed at you because you wanted it to be true. Um, and so those two worlds are the worlds, I think, uh, that are going to be interesting. But we keep thinking that we're going to be able to fix that, and I don't think we can. Not yet. Um, we're going to have to live with the fact that we're surrounded by complete craziness. Um, and journalism used to not be about truth. It used to be about manipulating people. It's going to be about manipulating people again. Um, for a while, and then uh, we'll figure out a way out of it. Um, we'll survive. Thank you so much. So we're already past the official stop time. Let's do maybe two rapid fire questions with apologies, but, but I think you know, I'll, I'll, get, uh, I'll get really I'm reprimanded sorry. if we do more than that. So quick question, sure. quick answer. This is a silly hypothetical question uh, for both Dr. Hemmen and Dr. Stone. Uh, would there be ever a day that you would accept the verdict of an AI jury for either you or somebody you love. I, 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 I don't wish that you will be the accused, but just hypothetically. <laughs> my, my, my short answer is absolutely. And why and why? Why? Because human beings are, are incredibly Bias, mm -hmm. and they don't know it. Um, um, I mean, there there are people. I, I guarantee you, there are people who've had judgments against them because they walked into a courtroom and they looked like the judge's uncle Bob, who he never liked. <laughs> and the judge doesn't quite understand it, but there's something wrong with this guy. I don't know what's happening here, and yeah, I'm listening to this, but there's something wrong with this guy. And that's what humans do. Um, and. We, we, have to, we have to find a way to actually make judgment calls that are less, um, um, that, that do not use factors that should not be part of the judgment calls. Um, and it been, it's been pointed out as people say, well, but these things are biased. It's like, yeah, but we'll at least have the bias in one place instead of in 10,000 places and we can't control it or understand it. I think humans, I, again, some of my best friends, human. <laughs> Um, but we are so bad at this. We are so bad at this. And we are so um, uh, needlessly cruel because we don't see where our own biases are. And I'm stunned by this all the time. So I would much rather have the machine. And I will go back to the UN for just a moment. Um, uh, there's the uh, proportional response. Um, uh, there was a discussion of our little group about proportional response and whether or not uh, a machine should be involved in making a proportional response in, in the, in, you know, to an attack. And I said, of course they should. And people were like, oh no, it's, it, it, there's, uh, you know, why would a machine do that? You want, don't have the machine responsible for that. It, it, it doesn't dignify people's death and it's like they're dead. You know, uh, that's it. And then for the, and then it was like so thankful. We had a, a military guy there who said, do you think we don't have equations? We have equations because we don't want people making these decisions. We don't want people making decisions about proportional response in the midst of anger and the fog of war. And those equations we can bring to the machine. 
because those are better decisions. And, and that's actually a real thing for me. Um, I, um, I, uh, our, sen our moral sense is bizarre. Got you. Thanks for your response. And Peter, do you have anything to add? You don't I, I, have to I would agree. I just say that's a fantastic response. <laughs> and I would just add, I think, you know, the, the, the knee jerk is always, let's not deploy AI technologies until they're perfect. And I think Chris's point is very well taken. We should deploy them when they're better than people. And better than people is not that high a bar in many cases. <laughs> um, but the sticking point is often that different people will get harmed by the decisions of the algorithms than they will from of the decisions of the people. And if you're one of those people who was harmed, you know, if you're the person who was dragged by the cruise car and you wouldn't, you know, have been dra dragged by, um, you know, by a human-driven car, you don't care that there's 40,000 people that aren't getting killed by a, because of autonomous cars. You're the one who's hurt, and that's always, that's still the sticking point, I think, in this, in this question. So it's not as straightforward as statistically better than people to get the public acceptance to make these decisions. But yes, I think, you know, for the greater good, the utilitarian argument, we can do better than people with, with machines. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much for your wisdom. Uh, unfortunately, it will require a constitutional change. <laughs> last, last very quick question. Um, thank you. Hi, my name is Shubhada, and I'm an engineer by undergrad background and a social worker by grad background. But uh, my question is that we're talking about harm to society, and we have a whole sector in the industry called the social sector created for dealing with the harms that society has you know, making. I don't know how you work with them. So the quick question is, do you work with social work or those areas that are yes. made for it? Because I see a lot of public-private partnerships, but I thought we should include the social sector in there so that they are there to deal with those impacts. Um, um, when you say social sector, I mean, I mean social work, like social work. nonprofit leaders I, are coming to. I, I actually don't. I actually don't. I tend to work with. I mean, I work with uh, like community leaders. Um, and uh, certainly psychologists, anthropologists, philosophers, but not social workers. But I understand, uh, actually my mom was a social worker. I understand that's a, that's a, that's a perspective that, that's really good. That was really good. Um, that's a perspective that I think is huge. Because yeah, there are uh, people who are, uh, it's, it's learning about how not only to solve problems on the ground, um, but also uh, what the impact of those solutions are going to be when, the, when, broadly, um, when broadly made. That's a really good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Good. So um, with that, I think we're going to very quickly transition the stage towards the, the panel. There'll be some videos while the, the transition is happening. But let's, let's thank Chris one more time for a fantastic talk. Thank you.